All right, 1 Samuel chapter 25, dealing with fools. There are 77, 77 mentions of the word fool in the Bible. The book of Proverbs has much to say and has the most to say on the subject of fools with 44 mentions of the 77. And the Bible describes a fool as someone who doesn't learn from their mistakes, right? In some ways, all of us are slow learners, and some of us are slow to learn, and in some ways, we can be like a fool. But the Bible describes someone as someone who doesn't learn from their mistakes. Proverbs 26, 11 says, as a, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats their folly. Proverbs 1, tells us that fools hate knowledge. Proverbs 15.5 tells us that fools hate their father's instruction. Proverbs 12.16 tells us that fools are quick-tempered. See any fools on the road today? <laughs> the mouth of a fool is perverse, Proverbs 19.1. The fool is deceitful, Proverbs 14.8, and proud, Proverbs 14.3. But the ultimate description of a fool is one who says in his heart, there is no God. Psalms 14.1. Again, the title of our message this evening is Dealing with Fools. And in, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, we meet a character named Nabal, whose name actually means fool. And we have our man David, who needs a bit of divine intervention and restrain and rescue from some of the foolishness of his own. So two fools in our text tonight. But first, 1 Samuel chapter 25 opens up, in, it opens up with verse 1, with the death, the mourning, and the burial of Samuel. And so let's read that together. Then Samuel died, and the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him, and buried him at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now, the death of Samuel marked the end of two things. First, the death of Samuel marked the end of an era in the nation of Israel known as the Judges. His death would be the end of the period of the Judges, and with Samuel himself being the last of those Judges, he would usher in the new kingdom of the kings, or the new era of the kings. And Samuel would help the nation transition from the period of the judges to the period of the kings, and he would be the one to anoint the first two kings of Israel, those being Saul and David. And so those two words in verse 1, Samuel died. Secondly, it marked the end of a life well lived. Samuel walked with the Lord all of his life. And it wasn't easy for him. He had godly parents. He had Elkanah and Hannah. He was a miracle child and an answer to the prayers of his mother Hannah, who was unable to have children. And in her petition to the Lord for her child, she promised to dedicate her son to the service of the Lord. And she did. And you remember, she would bring Samuel a new tunic every year in support of his work and service to the Lord. Beautiful relationship he had with his mother. He was brought to Eli, the high priest, and while he served as an assistant to the high priest, Samuel was exposed to the evil and the hypocrisy of Eli's sons. And yet Samuel remained true to the Lord and remained uncorrupted by the compromise of others. He was called to serve the Lord in a time when God's people in their hearts were spiritually cold and far away from him. The book of Judges clearly describes the climate of that time as the days when everyone did what? What was right according to their own sight. But with that, With that challenge, we're told of Samuel in Psalm 99.6. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. That's who Samuel was. 
His, his name actually means heard by God. And while all others were engaged in compromise, indulging in sin, and doing what was right in their own eyes, Samuel wanted more out of life. He had this yearning for more. And so Samuel called upon the Lord. And Samuel maintained a relationship with God. That's not easy to do when everybody around you in your home and in the workplace are engaged in the vile practices of the world and of the culture. Samuel served the Lord when the people rejected God, demanding a king. He was heartbroken over this. You remember that. God came to him and had to comfort him and say, don't take this personally. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. He walked with God through the heartbreak, demise, and insanity of, of the sin and sin of King Saul. He was heartbroken over this too, praying all night long for him. And even in his old age, we saw Samuel's zeal in chapter 15 for the will of God when he hacked up Agag into pieces because of Saul's unwillingness to be obedient to the Lord. But in all of this, all of this, Samuel was not moved away from his relationship with the Lord. He never ceased to be a man of prayer. He never ceased to be a voice for the Lord. He never ceased to be a godly influence to the people around him. He never ceased in his obedience and zeal to the will of God. Samuel remained faithful to the Lord through it all. And this is the testimony that Samuel leaves us with. And Israel rightly mourned for the man that was no longer there that consistently bore them up in prayer to the Lord. They mourned for him. And the death of Samuel is a reminder to us of something. It's a reminder to us that we can walk with God. It's a reminder to us that, that we can have fellowship with him here on this earth and, and that we too can be faithful to him. And it doesn't matter what the government is doing. It doesn't matter what traditions and, and culture society is embracing and endorsing. It doesn't matter what the school boards are saying and what the teachers are teaching. It doesn't matter what compromise and hypocrisy and evil and sin, sadly, that even some in the church are participating in. God shows us through the life of Samuel that there is a grace that he gives there's a grace that he gives and there is a strength that he gives to those who desire to live a life set apart for him. And this same grace that sustained and empowered Samuel till the day he died is offered to us today and is ours for the receiving. In verse 2 and 3, we're introduced to two of our main characters of our, our study tonight. We're introduced to a man named Nabal and a woman named Abigail. So let's read that together. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. So obviously nothing like his forefathers. He was of the house of Caleb. But we're given quite a bit of detail about this character named Nabal. And sadly, not much of it is good. He was rich, which is something, right? Again, his name when translated means fool, now, I don't know what kind of parents Nabal had. <laughs> okay, this is very unfortunate. I don't know 
what his parents were thinking and why they would choose such a name. Not when one of my kids came out did I say, oh, that looks like a fool, you know. It's just like that was just not, wasn't there. But, but we don't understand. There's things we don't understand. Um, it's possibly, could possibly be re- related to somehow the circumstances of his mother's pregnancy. Could have been a feud in the family. Or some think that this was a name that he earned for himself. Somewhat of a nickname, right? So Nabal, whatever the story is behind his name, he lived up to, or well, I guess he lived down to the name Nabal. And he was a fool. So we're told a few things about him here. We're told that he had 3,000 sheep and a thousand goats. Anybody impressed? Well, it was impressive back in that day. If you had a handful of each of these in that day, you were considered well off. And so here he is with 3,000 sheep and a thousand goats. But I find it interesting. I find it very interesting that the Bible includes specific details about this man's wealth. And this tells us something about God. This tells us that God knows that his eyes see and are aware in exact detail of the amount of all that you and I possess and all that will flow through our hands and that will pass through our hands. God is aware of the exact number. And if he's aware of that, Scary to think of all that he's aware of. Because the Bible says that all things are naked and open before him. He sees all things, right? And so much like the poor widow in Mark chapter 12, Jesus was aware of the exact amount that she possessed and the exact amount that she threw in the bucket. And he said, look at this woman, I tell you, she gave more than all that we're giving today. He knows exactly what we possess. And, and with God, the importance isn't how much we possess, but his interest is what? In what we do with what we possess. We're stewards. Stewards of all of our possessions. We're stewards of our children. We're stewards of our, our spouses, our, our wives and our husbands. We're, we're stewards of our time and our resources, and our talents, and our gifts. We're stewards. And God is aware of the exact measure that we all have, right? He's aware in great detail of all that we possess. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here, but we'll come back. I just want to illustrate a point here. But when we look, skip to verse 18, and when we look at what was brought by the hand of Abigail to David in verse 18, We're told that along with the bread, along with the wine, along with the grain and the raisins and the figs, Abigail brought how many sheep for David's men? Somebody see it? How many? Five. Five sheep. Five sheep for David and his men. How many men did David have? Come on, anybody know? There were 600 of them, right? What is five sheep (laughs) among 600 men? I did a little Google search. I found out that if you're very careful... With your sheep, you can get 50 servings out of it, okay? So 50 servings per sheep equals how many? 250. Somebody's not eating sheep, okay? Somebody's eating figs. Somebody's having some raisins, right? So I don't know how they're going to divide all this up. But what am I trying to say here? We gain some understanding about this man, Nabal, because he didn't willingly offer this. It had to be secretly forced out of his hand, from under his hand. So... What is five sheep among 3,000 and and 1,000 goats? Let's just say 4,000 total. Nothing, right? You put it in dollars. What's $5 among 4,000? Can any of you spare $5 out of 4,000? I hope so. It's not much, right? Okay. But if I'm a rich man like Nabal, and let's just say I have $4 billion, how much is that? That's actually $3 million, right? That's a lot of money. 
But percentage-wise, it's only 0.125%, not even 1%. The five sheep that Abigail delivered to David was a little bit more than one-tenth of a percent. One-tenth of a percent of what this guy owned. And Nabal was unwilling to give to David someone who worked for him out of his kindness and labored for months taking care of his sheep. Not one of them were sick. They didn't lose any of them. Not one of his shepherds were, were harmed. He was a wall around them, we're going to read. Not one-tenth of a percent of his riches. It had to be secretly forced out from under his hand. And the reason why the Bible gives us the exact amount of this man's riches is to inform us of how wickedly selfish and greedy and evil this man was. And later on, how unrepentant and hard-hearted he was. And so God slayed him. In verse 3, we're told that he was harsh and evil in his doings. He loved himself, though. He had no problem and no issues of throwing a kingly party for himself. And here in our text... An unexpected occasion arises in Nabal's life. And this is something that we can relate to. God is is good at doing things like this. He brings those unexpected occasions into our life. And in a time of abundance and great ceremony and celebration, along comes David with his 600 hungry men seeking food at Nabal's doorstep. That's the situation Nabal is in. That's his situation. Now what is revealed about the character of Nabal through this situation isn't pretty. But it's all God's doing. Oh, how often do those surprises come in life. Oh, how often do those surprises come along in life and they have their way of revealing those hidden, unpleasant trees that lie deep inside of our hearts. God is good at doing things like this. God is excellent at putting a mirror in front of our face and saying, this is you, what are you going to do about it? Two men are going to have a mirror put in front of their face tonight. And they're going to respond completely differently. And one of them is smote by God. I can't help but think of the unexpected events and surprises and the opportunities and the divine situations that God has ordained in my own life. All to help me to see the ugly in me. And I know that he loves you the same way because there are circumstances and things that are happening in your life right now. There's people in your life. There's relationships that you're in. There are things that are happening that he has ordained, that he has allowed, that is bringing out the ugly in you. Doesn't seem very loving, but it is. And I truly believe that God's design for both Nabal and David is to help them to see the ugly in both of them and that they would turn away from their sin and repent. And I believe that he's using that unexpected occasion in your life to do the same. We meet Abigail as well. This is the bright part of the story. There's something to smile about and rejoice in. Her name means father's joy. Obviously, her dad was happy the day that she was born. Nabal's parents, not so much. But Abigail, Abigail's parents were overjoyed. Her father was joyful. 
And we're told she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. She was a woman whose beauty and disposition captured the eye and admiration of others. She was a showstopper. And on top of that, we're going to see that she was a very godly woman. Greatly to be admired. Beautiful, wise, and godly. Sounds like someone I married. Yeah, that's what I say. So Nabal was a blessed man. He was blessed materially as well as in his marriage to Abigail. And my goodness, this guy had every reason to be grateful, to be happy, to rejoice. And yet he wasn't. And it's a mystery. And you might be wondering, how in the world does a wicked man like Nabal end up with a treasure like Abigail? Right? Any of you wondering that? I went, out to, uh, I went out to dinner on my birthday. I just celebrated my 46th birthday, um, September 12th. Um, but I celebrated my 23rd year with the Lord on September 10th. So I'm at that halfway point. And uh, my, my waiter, who comes to this church, for some reason, he was talking to my wife, and he said, why did you marry him? <laughs> True story. He comes to this church. So, true story. So how, how does this wicked man, Nepal, end up with a treasure? I look at my own life and I think it happened for me. I don't know. How, how, you know, how did it happen for you? I don't know. So, I don't know what else to tell you. You, you can tell me your story later. But this poor thing, you know, poor thing, she's a treasure. And, um, you know, just a side note for you men, just a side note. This is, this is a bonus, okay? <laughs> this is a bonus. You know, I remember the Lord speaking to me about my wife before I married her. And I remember him telling me, cherish her. She's my gift to you. And Proverbs says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Okay, that's a bonus. Just stop it. <laughs> your wife is a treasure and treat her like one, okay? All right, otherwise you're in a ball and you're gonna die. <laughs> so, okay, so let's pray. Um, poor thing. It was probably an arranged marriage and, and how awful it must have been for her dad to have to give her away to such a scoundrel. More than likely, it was an arranged marriage that she had no control over. It's probably the likely scenario. So moving on, let's go to four through nine. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent 10 young men. David said to the young men, go up to Carmel, go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, peace be to you, peace to your house and peace to all that you have. Now I've heard that you have shearers, your shepherds were with us. And we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David and waited. Now, the sheep shearing season, holy moly, say that three times, sheep, shear, sheep, sheep shearing season. The sheep shearing season was much like the time of harvest. Okay, it was the end of, of, of a year's long labor. It was hard work, but it was a time of joy and celebration. It was a yearly event that typically took place in the spring. And during this time, an owner would throw a huge party to celebrate the success of the year. And he would reward all those that labored with him throughout the year for all their hard work that they put into it. Even stingy Nabal was preparing for this feast. You know, we're going to see the abundance of food. Even he argues with, with David's young men and says, shall I give you know, the, the, the lamb that I've prepared for my shearers to these men that I don't know? So 
he prepared a feast for even his workers. And so David, when he hears of this shearing of Nabal's sheep, he knows, he knows the investment and he knows the labor and the time that he and his men, it would have been months, months of labor that David contributed to the success and abundance of that year. Free labor. So remember, David himself was a shepherd. So he knew the ins and outs of shepherding. The land that Nabal would send a sheep out for the shepherds to graze in wasn't his own land. Okay? It, was, it was neutral territory, which, which, would have been subjected to, um, which would have subjected the flock and the shepherds to the potential hazards of, of wild beasts and bands of raiders and thieves. And it, it was common, and it, it would be expected, that an owner could potentially lose 3 to 5% of his flock. So let's just say 5%. 5% loss of 4,000 would be what, you math majors? What would it be? 2,000. Who said 2,000? My goodness. Could have been 200, right? He, could, he should have realistically expected a loss of 200 sheep that year. But what did David say? What did David say? The young men, right? They lost how much in the time that David was with them? Zero. That's amazing. Not to mention the potential loss of the shepherds guarding the flock. It was a rough business. And David knew, David knowing, David knowing the potential hazards was roaming in the wilderness with his men being hunted by King Saul in the midst of personal misery, right? Is doing what? He's doing a good work. He and his men are employed in a good work. What an example. It's a great example of not being idle in the midst of personal misery. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 encourages God's people to maintain love and good works as the day of Jesus' return approaches. And we're to do this irrespective to the personal misery miseries were presently going through. And in this, David is an awesome and inspirational example to us. And not only was this in David's heart, he brought others along with him in their misery. And David's kindness potentially saved Nabal hundreds of sheep and the potential lives of the shepherds of Nabal's flock. But it's important for us to notice in verse 8, Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. So David and his men were hungry, and he says, please give whatever comes to your hand. The word favor used here is the word grace. So it's important for us to realize David, David isn't demanding payment for his services. What David is seeking is he's seeking grace from Nabal. He's appealing to Nabal's nature. But you can't squeeze water out of a dry sponge. There was no grace in Nabal's heart to give. And David sending 10 young men, that tells us something of David's expectation, right? Right? He expected to receive something from Nabal. And he estimated in his mind that, that 10 men should be enough to carry it back to the camp. That's what David's thinking. I saved this man hundreds of sheep. I, I, I'm guessing that he's going to give us something that, yeah, 10 guys, 10 guys should be enough. Let's, let, let's send 10. Poor David, right? Poor David for, you know, in his surprise, um, to his surprise, it's not what's going to happen. But we all know how it goes with expectations, don't we? David has measured in his mind what he thought would be a reasonable gesture of kindness for all that he's done. And he sent 10 men. The problem with this is he's dealing with Nabal. And Nabal is nothing like David. Jesus helps us to manage our expectation of others in Luke 6, 35. 
but love your enemies, do good, right? David's doing that. David's loving his enemies, do good. David's doing that and lend. David's doing that. He's lending his time, hoping for nothing in return. Oops. Hoping for nothing in return. Well, that, that's something that uh, I'm not quite on board with yet, Lord. And your reward will be great. Hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. You see, there's something in David's heart that's not quite like the Lord yet. He was loving his enemies, he was doing good, he was lending, but that hoping for nothing in return, David wasn't quite there in his heart. And you will be sons of the Most High. We are to be like him, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. What we're going to see in David and what we can relate to in the next few verses is a part of David's heart that has yet to be yielded to the Lord. A part of David's heart, a part of his sinful nature that isn't quite dead yet. And I know, well, I know none of us can relate to that, right? But let's read on anyway. Verses 10 through 12. Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men when I do not know where they come from? So David, David's young men, turned on their heels as quick as they came, they left so quickly because they knew there was no way they were ever going to make any way with this man. He was unreasonable. And they went back and they came and told him all these words. And David said, don't worry about it, guys. God's kind to the unthankful and the ungodly. God's kind to them, right? That's what David said, right? No way. When David saw his young men coming back to the camp, can you imagine? You imagine you've been there, right? You have this expectation. You're hungry. And you see these 10 men coming back from meeting with Nabal. The 10 men that you guessed in your mind would be enough to carry all that delicious lamb back, right? And what do you see? You see nothing. <laughs> so immediately David's wondering what happened. And so he talks to these men. These young men turned on their heels. They came back to the camp. They arrived back at camp. David sees their empty hands. And they deliver to David the words of Nabal. David didn't have any sheep. Or Nabal didn't have any sheep. He didn't have anything for David except words. They weren't very nice words. And we read David's response in verse 13. David said to his men, Every man gird his sword. So every man girded his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went with David, and 200 stayed with the supplies. We learned something here about leadership. And this is just a side note for you. And it's a sobering reminder for those of us that are leaders, leaders in our home or leaders anywhere. That people are going to follow you even when you are absolutely wrong. Isn't that scary? People are 400 young men following David and his heart is so far away from the heart of God 
scary, sobering, but something that we need to take to heart. We need to be careful as leaders and make sure we're engaged in fighting the Lord's battles and not our own. So it wasn't too long ago. There's been a turn here. I don't know if you noticed it, but it wasn't too long ago. Verse 6, David, David's instruction to his men, his young men concerning Nabal was what? Peace. <laughs> We are so far from peace right now, right? Peace, peace to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. And now what is it? Death. (laughs) Death to you and death to your young men, death to all the males in your household. Everyone grab your sword and follow me. Every male of the household of Nabal is dying tonight. David is removed from that place of peace. David isn't an old man here. You know, we see a different David in his older years. You remember when Shimei came and he cursed David? He's throwing rocks at him, throwing dust and kicking him at David. It's when Absalom was trying to take over the kingdom and David had to flee. And what did David say? Let him curse me. You know, his men were like, can we just cut, can we go cut their heads off right now? And David said, let them curse. Who knows if God will show me kindness on behalf of their cursing me today. That's a new David. That's a transformed David. That's a a David who surrendered his heart to the Lord, right? But David isn't that man yet. (laughs) Just like you, okay? You're not that man or you're not that woman yet. Just like myself, all right? There's, There's work to be done. He's not that man. So David is an old man. He's a young man leading a group of other young men. And David, David isn't so much as upset about not receiving the food from Nabal. He's upset. David's upset because he's been disrespected, because he's been insulted. And he's been disrespected, insulted in front of his men. And David, instead of getting rid of the, the source of the insult, right? David takes it to a whole new level. David's not just trying to get rid of Nabal. David wants to get rid of Nabal and every male in the home. This is not a godly anger. This is David in his flesh taking things to an extreme, getting ready to avenge himself of the dishonor and disrespect that he received. And David's probably a little bit hungry. (laughs) You got... You got 600 of these guys that are probably really hungry. They were ready, you know, and and, and most definitely David, you know, David was thinking that, you know, we're going to take what we need from these guys. So David's heart is totally in the wrong place. And again, he's got these 400 men following him. In chapter 24, and you notice, notice also, did any of these men stand up and say anything to David? Did anybody stand up to him? No. That's not a good friend. (laughs) Okay, I hope you have good friends in your life and good brothers and sisters that are like, hey man, you're sounding a little crazy right now. (laughs) Okay, you need to calm down. David didn't have that. He just had guys that were just going to go with him. And so in chapter 24, you remember last week, chapter 24, David, this is a beautiful picture of David restraining in the cave, right? Restraining his hand from harming Saul. You remember that? Just last week, just one chapter before. But a fool named Nabal comes along with a few ill words. And David is bloodthirsty. David is un. Corked. David is angry, about to take matters into his own hand and do something that he's going to regret and look back on with shame. David is emotionally charged, and David is about to do something really dumb. Have your emotions ever caused you to do something really dumb? Yeah? A couple of honest people. Interesting, isn't it? 
Interesting how victorious we can be in one moment and how foolish we can be in the next. It's interesting how patient and courageously David could handle and endure all the insults of Goliath, right? With, the, with a godly confidence and ease. And, and we see David in Samuel enduring the months and the years of, of insults and, and disrespect of King Saul, the jealousy that he endured from King Saul. Even last week, like we said, restraining his hand when he had an opportunity to kill him and was encouraged to do so. Verse 17 of 24, Saul crying out to David said, You are more righteous than I, David, for you've rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And you would think that in this situation, you would think that 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 David has grown accustomed to the insults and disrespect of others, right? I guess we all reach a breaking point. But it's also interesting how it's the Nabal. It's the fool that comes out of nowhere. that causes us to stumble. It's the guy that cut you off. For me, I was getting coffee at Starbucks. Not recently, but I remember it well. And I like to back into my parking spot, right? So I pull forward, and you know what's going to happen, right? Two young kids just pull into the parking spot. And I'm backing up into the spot. And you know what I said? God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. (laughs) Because I'm there, okay? David's not, but I'm there. I almost got out of my car. I did get out of my car. And I was just like puffing my chest out, right? You know, first I had to see if I could take them, you know. I just, <laughs> be honest. Just being honest, I got out of the car and I had to see, well, can I take these guys for a look? Oh, my car. And I look at them like this. And I gave them the stare down, right? And they completely ignored me, which made me even more angry. Miss gracious. Right? It's the fool that comes out of nowhere. Right, the, the Goliaths and the Sauls, those guys we can prepare for. We're in prayer, right? We know they're coming. We know they're there. We see them, right? We, we know what to expect. We're prayed up. We read our Bibles. We're ready to go, right? It's the fool. It's the fool that comes out of nowhere. It's the Nabal. And, and, and it's horrible because then I became the Nabal. I became, I became worse than Nabal, right? It's horrible. Proverbs 26, 4 through 5. It says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. How do you deal with fools? Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Don't be drawn into his his anger and his ways. Don't let him suck you in, you know. I know. They're out there. Okay, the Bible. Like I said, there's 77 mentions of fool in the Bible. Now, you're, you're like, okay, well, Matthew tells us not to call anybody a fool. No, that's pronouncing judgment on someone and condemnation on someone is the context of that. But there are fools out there, okay? And just so you know, there are fools in here, (laughs) okay? Hello. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you become like him yourself. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. When dealing with a fool, 
you need to commit them to the Lord and pray for them. Why is that so hard to do? Why is that so hard to do? And I don't mean God get him. That's, that's not committing him to the Lord. I don't mean that. I mean pray for him. We're not going to get... What? Oh, man. Verse 14 to 17. I had good intentions tonight. 14 to 17. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them. When we were in the fields, they were a wall to us both night and day, and all the time we were with them keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master, against his household, for he is such a scoundrel that no one can speak to him. Again, just another description of Nabal, a scoundrel. No one could talk to this guy, okay? That's how hard and wicked he was. And we're not sure how this young man was aware of the harm that was determined against Nabal and his household. But we're told by this young man that Nabal reviled the young men sent by David. The word revile means to scream at and sharply criticize. So we get an idea of the tone of the room with these 10 men. You can picture it, Nabal sitting in his seat of authority, the 10 men lined up in front of him, and just Nabal railing and screaming at them, who is the son of Jesse? You know, all of this stuff going on, spit flying out of his mouth. And, um, and so, however it must have, whatever, um, it must have been real ugly in that room um, for these young men to believe that Nabal's behavior would provoke um, that sort of response from David and his men. And so, convinced that harm was determined against them, he voiced his concern to Abigail. And, and she recognized the danger of the situation because she was a wise and understanding woman. So, um, she responded in haste. Verse 18, where is it? Verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seas of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisin, 200 cakes of figs, loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, go on before me. I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. Again, she was a wise woman. <laughs> she, she knew that if she said anything to him, that there would, it just wouldn't have happened. And what would have happened? All the males would have died. So she knew that. So, so it was as she rode on the donkey that she went down under cover of the hill. And there were David and his men coming down toward her, and she, said, and she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain I've protected. David's still venting here. <laughs> David is mad, okay? And, and here he is on the way, and he's still angry. Surely in vain I've protected. He's talking to himself. Surely in vain I've protected all this fellow has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him, and he has repaid me evil for good. There's that again. There it is again, evil for good. You know, guys, it's going to happen. I think that's one of the practical lessons that we need to take from, from tonight. What happens when you're evil, when you're good, not you're evil, when you're good, the good that you do the other, the kindness that you show others is spit on. That's a big lesson that we need to take with ourselves tonight. And I don't know what kind of spit's coming your way this week, but you got to remember this, all right? The Lord wants you to honor him when this, this, this happens, so... Um, and he has repaid me evil for good. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male all night who belong to him by morning light. When Abigail, I'm just going to keep reading, saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey. She fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, on me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. And please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. What a, what a woman, right? Your David is, he's still angry. And this is a picture of God's restraining grace in our lives. 
Okay, God empowered, God, God brought his restraining grace into David's life when he had an opportunity to kill Saul. And now he's bringing a gracious, a, a great, you know, just a woman named Abigail into his life who is going to keep him from doing something um, that he's going to regret. And how much time, what time do we usually get done, Rich? We're usually done by eight? Okay. A little bit of time. Sorry, I gotta figure this out here. So let's read this. Let's read um, Abigail's discourse here together. All right, on me, my Lord, is what she said. And and what she's trying to do here is she's actually trying to save the life of her husband. She's trying to save the life of of the people in her um, in her home. Um, Please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. You notice how she approached David. She quickly dismounted and she fell on her face. She's coming in a humble position, right? Um, And so please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. And that's pretty sad that uh, this is how she feels about her husband. But uh, nobody knows us better than our spouse, correct? And so she is just speaking the truth about who he is. For as his name is, so is he, Nabal, in his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. So Abigail, what she's saying here is if I had been there, I promise you things would have been different. I was unaware of what was going on, but now that I am, I'm here. And, and, and so now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from committed, coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm from my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you. David's like, who is this woman? (laughs) <laughs> Who is this woman and how does she know all these details about my life? You know, David is gobsmacked, I promise you. He's just, it, it, his, uh, his attentions are drawn into the words that are coming out of her mouth. He recognizes that this woman is sent of the Lord. She knows specific details about his life. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. But the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. This is, this is a prophecy. She's letting David know. You know, David at, at one point is going to be so despondent. He said, for sure I'm going to perish at the hand of Saul. But she's letting David know, no, you're going to live. You're going to live through this experience that you're going through. And the lives of your enemies, he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. She is speaking David's love language right now talking about a sling and stones and David is like my goodness what a woman <laughs> yeah I would say it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you what's she doing she's reminding David of the promises of God And has appointed you ruler over Israel. Again, a word of prophecy, letting him know that he is going to be the king over Israel. That this will be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause, or that my Lord has avenged himself. What's she trying to do here? She's trying to save David from having regret and a guilty conscience about doing something that he would regret later. Right? David wouldn't be, she's trying to protect the blessing that God is bringing David into. There are some blessings that 
we're not able to fully enjoy because of the stupidity that we've done along the way. And that's what she's trying to save David from. And we know that this is Abigail, but ultimately it's who? It's God, right? This is God trying to save David. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Now, I don't think that she's saying, you know, what's going to happen is David's going to end up marrying her. I don't think that she's saying, you know, remember me, you know. She's not giving David her phone number, okay. Just, re- just remember, she's, she, what she's saying, what she's saying is, is look on this moment. And, and when you're happy in the future about not doing what your anger wanted you to do, just remember how the Lord sent me to you and rejoice. Remember me, your maidservant. And it's not written in the Bible, but between verse 31 and 32 is just this pause. <laughs> There's just this, this, this woman is on her face, remember? And, and while she's on her face, I don't know if she's still on her face while she's speaking to David, but I don't imagine that she, gave, that she stood up. I imagine she stayed down. And so David is just looking at this woman in awe, in awe of the intimate knowledge that she had about him personally, in, in awe of the prophecy comforted by the words that were coming out of her mouth concerning his future, aware of the promises that that God had personally given to him. And David's in awe. He's in awe. He's in astonishment. He's in wonder. And a couple things about Abigail here. We don't know how long she's been married to Nabal, but we know she's been married to him long enough to know exactly who he is. But what an amazing, what's amazing to me is is for her to be in such a marriage to someone like Nabal. And that Abigail remained spiritual and didn't become like her husband. It's amazing. And that, just like we spoke about Samuel and the grace that God gives to a life that surrendered to him, God gives grace to Abigail to be a godly woman She lived with a fool, but she didn't become like him. And I'm sure because of the treatment that Nabal showed David's young men, that there were times in her home where she herself was face to face with the ugly man. Right? You could hear the screams, right? You could hear the disrespect. And I, and I know that this is a sensitive issue even for some here tonight. And I, and, and I just, I just want to say, you know, to, to any of you that have a Nabal in your life, you know, whether it's, it's by marriage or relationship, either personal or, or business or, you know, professional, it, it's important that you do everything that you can to resist answering a fool according to their folly and you remain spiritual and unlike them. Be an Abigail and you pray. You pray that God would forgive them and soften their heart. And Look at David's response. David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me and blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you've kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand for indeed as the Lord God of Israel lives who has kept me back from hurting you unless you had hurried and come to me 
Surely by morning light, no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had brought uh, him and said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. We're going to have to wrap things up here. Um, Man, you know what? No, we're not going to wrap things up. We got, <laughs> we, we got three more minutes, so um, I'm going to use them. <laughs> I was just sorry. I'm going to use them. Um, you know what? Because I, I really feel like we need to get to verses 36 through 38, and we'll end on those. So... Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king, and Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he's very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became like stone. It happened after about ten days that the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. These verses are so sad. Okay, this is, this is very, very sad. Remember I told you there were two men. One responded to that, that look in the mirror, right? This is who you are. And he repented, David. And here's Nabal. And he's been given a look in the mirror of who he is. And God put a mirror in front of his faith, face. And so, in dealing with her foolish husband, Abigail spoke truth of all that transpired in his heart. And his heart became like stone within him. And this is that tragic moment in a sinner's life when God gives him over to his debased heart. And what puzzles me, and this is what upsets me, this is what puzzles me is he had 10 days. He had a grace period of 10 days. God gave Nabal 10 days. Five sheep is nothing among 600 men. He could have sought after David. He could have humbled himself. He could have blessed David and his men. He could have traded that heart of stone for a new one. But he refused. He refused. Whether through pride or greed, we don't know. But he refused to make right his sin. And he suffered the loss of everything. What a tragedy. What a fool. When you're wrong, simply admit you're wrong. <laughs> when you're wrong, just admit you're wrong and seek forgiveness. It truly is a picture of the ultimate fool who refuses to acknowledge the kindness of Jesus dying on the cross. It's a fool that refuses to acknowledge what Jesus did for them on the cross. Nabal refused to acknowledge the kindness of David, right? Right? He refused to acknowledge the kindness of David, and instead he treated him with scorn, and for that he died. You might say, where was the mercy and restraining grace of the Lord towards Nabal? It was there. He just refused it. Abigail spoke to both David and Nabal, but much like Cain in Genesis 4, God visited Cain, right, with his restraining grace. And what did he say to Cain in his restraining grace? Sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. That's restraining grace. And what did Cain do with God's restraining grace? He ignored it. Just like Nabal. Nabal refused God's grace as Cain did. What a story. With some fools, God is gentle. And it works. And in his mercy, he sends an Abigail. And they yield. And with some fools, God is harsh in his mercy. And he bruises the heart. But it's mercy. And the desired response is the same. God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. We could put a finger, we can put a finger on the pulse of Nabal's greed, his selfishness, his harsh and evil dealings with people, but Nabal's ultimate sin, 
His ultimate sin was allowing his heart to, be rem to remain untouched by God. That's Nabal's ultimate sin, to allow his heart to remain untouched by God. Now, I don't know what you brought here with you this evening. Maybe you've been removed from that place of peace like David. Maybe God has allowed a circumstance in your life that's caused something ugly to bubble to the surface. Maybe, maybe there's a Nabal in your life that you need to commit to the Lord. Maybe you're here tonight and you're Nabal. Well, let me tell you, you will never know any change in your heart unless you see the kindness of the Lord dying on the cross in your place. It should have been you. And until you see him there, you will never change. And your heart will remain hard and you will die in your sin. This is not what God wants for you. And for the rest of us, I leave you with Galatians 6, 9. Let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season. We shall reap if we do not lose heart. There is a reward. There is a reward when we receive nothing in return for our kindness. There is a harvest for those who sow in kindness. Our job is to not lose heart in doing good. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your sustaining grace. Lord, that for some of us, it, it, it's kept us from performing the, the evil that, uh, that our hearts can be bent towards. And thank you, Lord, for the mercy that you show us when we're foolish. And Lord, thank you for the circumstances that you've brought into our lives that have just bubbled to the surface just that ugly nature that's not like you. And Lord, there are some of us here tonight that just want to surrender that to you. And I pray, Jesus, as you poured out your grace on Samuel, as you poured out your grace on Abigail, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit and your grace upon those that surrender that to you today and that you would help them, Lord, to be godly. You said godliness with contentment is great gain. And Lord, there are some here tonight that have a Nabal in their life and there's some here that are going to run into a fool this week. And I pray, Jesus, that you would help us not to answer the fool according to his folly, lest we become like him. Please help us, Lord. Please be merciful to us. And please pour out your grace upon us. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.